And we're live. Hi, I'm Azza Greenwood, a scientist at MIT Media Lab, and um, I'll be teaching the computational law course um, at MIT for our um, winter session um, next week. And with us today, um, by express invitation, I'm delighted to introduce Bill Rosenblatt, who is truly an expert in DRM and in rights expressions languages. We met at the Open Music Initiative, got to talking about computational contracts and licensing and the essence of how, how to express legal terms um, in a way that's machine readable and uh, processable. And um, honestly, I was uh, so impressed and also found the topic so very, very timely and relevant to the course that I asked if he'd be willing to give us a guest lecture. And you kindly agreed. So thank you, Bill. Uh, and I appreciate your diligence in putting the slides together to really conform them to the topics in our class this year as well. And uh, if you'd be so kind as to maybe introduce yourself with a, a little more background, um, and then um, we can dig right into your presentation. Great. Well, uh, first of all, can you hear me all right? Yep, your audio is good. Okay, great. So, Daza, thank you so much for inviting me to do this. Uh, it's a real pleasure. It's been a pleasure to get to know you and your your very, very interesting program at MIT. Um, I'm someone who turned down MIT as my undergrad institution, so it's it's a little bit of shame, I suppose, or or um, uh, comeuppance that, that I'm doing this. Um, but in any case, my name is Bill Rosenblatt, as, as you mentioned. And I am, um, let's go to, uh, it'll explain a little bit of my background on the first slide. So I'm just gonna go right to that. Uh, just waiting for it to come up. Or did I, ah, okay. Let's, there we go. Okay, I hit share and nothing is happening. And my browser is hung. Okay, um, well, we can just give it a moment. Um, Hangout on there is great uh, in terms of the, uh, you know, the price can be beat, it's free, uh, but sometimes it can be a little bit laggy. Well, this is not laggy, the app's frozen. I'm getting the, the blue circle of death and the window is grayed out. Okay, um, let me take a quick look. We're actually in the same office right now, just one sec. Um, I try killing it and where's the hangout? Oh, I see. Weird. Okay, well, you're still online. But yeah, I want, maybe you could kill it and come back in. Um, And we're really back. So you can see we're uh, 10 yeah, we're years years of technology here. <laughs> um, okay, but uh, but you're back, Bill. And uh, do you want to give uh, the screen share a try? Okay, looks good. I can see your. Yep, I, I can see your presentation. Oh wait. Okay, so we we're, we're looking at we're looking at the presentation, and the title of my presentation is "Rights Expression Languages or Copyright Law Rumbles with Technology in a Dark Alley." Uh, this this picture here is from the Broadway show West Side Story. <laughs> the two gangs, the two rival gangs, meet in the back alley and, and have have a gang fight. So, um, just to give you a little bit more about my background, I am a consultant. I've run uh, my firm, Giant Steps Media Technology Strategies, since the year two thousand. My background is in computer science and software engineering. Uh, professionally, I've been an IT executive in the publishing and media industry. Um, I have been a technology market strategy guy for uh, Sun Microsystems. And I've also been a book editor, a book uh, author, and a radio producer for a period of several years. And I wrote a book on DRM back in the year 2001. 
which introduced me to copyright law um, in addition to uh, other activities that I was doing in the publishing industry where publishing industry was trying to get to grips with this thing called the internet that was coming down and was going to destroy everyone's business and so on. Uh, I run a conference called Copyright and Technology, which actually is taking place uh, next week in New York. And I've spoken on this subject matter at the World Economic Forum in Davos. I've guest lectured um, at various places, uh, Columbia, Carnegie Mellon, um, NYU, and, and so on. And I've been an expert witness in various copyright and patent litigations that have to do with copyright in the digital age, digital media technologies, and things of that sort. So basically, I'm not a lawyer, but I play one on TV sometimes. Um, so what I'd like to do is start with... And Bill, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, uh, but um, for some reason we're getting a little... Um, oh, there we go. Okay, no, we're good. I just want to make sure that your slides were showing and they're, they're good now. Please continue. Okay, so I wanted to start by mentioning a theory that Larry Lessig brought up in his first book, Code and Other Laws of Cyberspace, which is really a, a book that I think a lot of the uh, people taking this class are going to be familiar with or at least have seen. And I think it's an extremely important book, regardless of what your views are on, on copyright in the digital age. And one of the things that I think was great about this book is that he characterize these four forces of regulation and that's when you're talking about the online world or the tech world or you're talking about the real world there are these four forces that each contribute to the way the world operates and is governed or regulated and those four forces are the law which is laws as we know them the market which is just the way businesses behave the way economics behaves um, architecture, which is the technology or physical aspects of the realm that you're looking at regulating or, or not regulating, as the case may be. And then norms, which are behaviors, what we're used to doing as humans and what we think is acceptable versus not acceptable. And as we have learned, these four factors differ greatly between the real world and cyberspace, or what used to be called cyberspace back in 1999 when Lessig wrote this book. Um, and the idea of rights expression languages, oh, the, the idea of rights expression languages is really to try to, in some sense, bridge the gap between these two worlds and to readjust the balance among these four forces of regulation. And this may sound hazy right now, but hopefully it will be clearer uh, as, as we go on here. So we're talking about rights expression languages which are in the realm of copyright. And so I thought for those of you who aren't already familiar, it would be useful to go over the basics of what rights are um, given to creators of copyrighted works under US copyright law. And of course, this is all a US-based presentation your mileage may vary outside the US. So there is the US copyright law and it, it accords to the creator of a work, what we call a bundle of rights. And one of them is, uh, in fact, it's so fundamental that many people ignore it. Section 101 of the Copyright Act mentions that a work is a material object. So these rights apply to material objects, they do not, apply to piles of bits that fly around the internet and are independent of the medium that they may be stored on at any given time. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that uh, more uh, later. So then the copyright owner has exclusive rights, the right of reproduction, which is making copies, the right of distribution, which is sending those copies to someone else or sending the original copy to someone else. Creation of derivative works, which are things like film, adaptations of books or um, th things of that nature, uh, edits of photographs, excerpts of written works, and so on. Public display and public performance, depending on the type of work it is, also copyright owners exclusive right. And then recently there was an addition made to the Copyright Act, which uh, accords certain additional rights for certain types of visual works, such as sculptures, paintings, and limited edition photographs the right to have the work properly attributed to the creator and the what's what 
we call a moral right, which is uh, the right to prevent reputational harm by damage or mutilation to the work or of the work. And then there's something that isn't a right per se, it's a limitation on, on rights that we call the first sale doctrine and internationally it's called the doctrine of exhaustion, which is that once you obtain a work legally, such as you go buy a book or you buy a CD or someone gives you, legally gives you a, a CD or a book or a DVD or what have you, um, you can dispose of it in whatever way you want and the entity that gave it to you, whether it's a publisher, retailer, friend, relative, whatever, has no further control over that. So if you want to resell it, you can resell it. If you want to lend it, you can lend it. If you want to bequeath it to your heirs, you can do that. Um, that's, that's a limitation on exclusive rights and copyright law. Parenthetically, um, there are classes of software to which it does not apply. Okay, so once we have these exclusive rights, we can also talk about how others can use content that you have created. Of course, if I obtain a piece of content, I can use it personally. That's the normal thing. I can license rights from the copyright owner, that is rights beyond um, the ones that I would get normally. And the mechanism for doing that is normally a contract. And then there is something else called fair use, section 107 of the Copyright Act, which is really a defense to an allegation of infringement. It's, you're accused of infringing my copyright, you say, no, I made a fair use of it, and you explain in a court why you think you made a fair use of the work. Um, it's really un understood mostly as a defense to an allegation of infringement, although there is one recent appeals court decision in the so-called dancing baby case where they're starting to look at it more as, a, as an affirmative right rather than as what, what we call an affirmative defense. And there's a whole bunch of, of stuff that I could talk about here. Um, there are people who are far more expert in fair use law than I am, but the main thing that we need to understand here is that fair use is not decidable by a machine or, or automated process. And I like to refer people to a seminal uh, law review article from Pierre Laval, who is now a Second Circuit Appeals Court judge. Uh, the article was called Toward a Fair Use Standard. It's there in the footnotes. You can look it up. And the, the sort of money quote from that article is, we should not adopt a bright line standard unless it were a good one, and we do not have a good one. So bear that in mind as we keep going. So what's a rights expression language? It is a machine readable description of rights that relate to the use of a copyrighted work. The idea of a rights expression language is to make rights and licenses understandable and actionable at internet speed as opposed to uh, falling into what I call uh, the trap door into the legal system, meaning hiring a lawyer to explain what rights you may or may not have, and then perhaps taking a risk on exercising those rights and, and so on. And rights expression languages have two goals that are distinct yet overlapping. And we're gonna talk about each of those. One is to enforce rights and to, to act as part of an, a rights enforcement mechanism. And then the second is just to automate a licensing process for the sake of convenience and automation. Okay, so let's first talk about right, uh, RELS, rights expression languages for rights enforcement. And we are, of course, talking about DRM, digital rights management, which is the field that I uh, got into uh, right at the beginning, um, pretty much. Mark Steffick is one of the handful of people who can be said to have uh, invented this field back in the mid 90s. And uh, he walked into my office one day uh, with his colleagues at Xerox, they were looking to commercialize technology that they had developed. And one of the things that he gave to me was uh, the thing that it says in the second bullet point of this slide, a white paper called Letting Loose the Light, Igniting Commerce and Electronic Publication. This was written in 1995, originally uh, just a, an internal Xerox PARC document, but it uh, was published subsequently uh, in a book called Internet Dreams, where Mark Steffick was the editor, and this is sort of his one, or perhaps one of a couple of chapters that he contributed to the book. 
a very interesting book published by the home team, MIT Press, in 1996. Um, he also took out a bunch of patents, the one relevant one of which is this uh, patent that we call the 403 patent, System for Controlling the Distribution and Use of Digital Works Having Attached Usage Rights, where the usage rights are defined a usage rights grammar. So what that basically means is a DRM system that uses a rights expression language. That's pretty much what that patent is said to cover. He wrote, a, he designed a rights language called Digital Property Rights Language, DPRL, and it was based on LISP. LISP, as many of you may know, was the seminal uh, artificial intelligence language, and Stefik has uh, an AI background. In fact, I was familiar with some of his AI work that he did as a grad student at Stanford before he joined uh, PARC. So Xerox took this and attempted to commercialize it as a product called Content Guard, which was a DRM system. And in 1999, when I was at a publishing company, um, we were looking to perhaps uh, adopt a DRM system, and this is one of the products we looked at. So going to the next slide, um, this technology morphed into something called XRML, the Extensible Rights Markup Language. So these names are all based on XML, which came out around 1997-98 timeframe as the sort of standard uh, way of marking up data, structured data, and structured content. Um, it's, it's one of the most influential technical standards in the modern era. And so Xerox decided to glom on to XML and recast DPRL as an XML-derived language called XRML. And first, they just released version 2 of DPRL and based it on XML instead of LISP. Then they renamed it XRML uh, as an expansion of DPRL 2.0. And for several years, they tried to sell this DRM system to publishers and you know record companies and whatnot. And it didn't really succeed commercially. So they dropped their products in 2002 to focus on licensing their portfolio of patents. I'm not going to go through this entire slide. You can read it later if you're interested in the history of this. but. They submitted XRML to MPEG, which had a standards initiative in, in this space. And what MPEG ended up doing was adopting a variation on XRML as an MPEG standard, which went nowhere. No one really uses the standard. Um, hello? Sorry about that. Um, please continue. Keep going? OK. So um, XRML was a big deal in the mid-2000s, but no one really used it for anything except Microsoft, which, along with Time Warner, became a part owner of Content Guard, which is why I call this the Establishment Rel. It's Xerox, Time Warner, Content Guard, and a French a company called Thomson uh, that were the owners of this company. They subsequently sold it to a company called Pendrel, which is a patent licensing company. And that's kind of the end of its uh, relevance, other than if you use certain Microsoft products where they use XRML for license management. So this is just some example code that I found um, in XRML that shows uh, that you're paying $15, and for that, you get to the right to play or view an ebook and the right to print it. So you can dig into the details. It's actually pretty self explanatory if you're comfortable reading X, XML. So then we come to the other important rights language, which I call the Indie Rights Expression Language, which is ODRL, Open Digital Rights Language. This was created a few years after a DPRL and XRML, created in the early 2000s. And uh, it, the primary creator of it was a guy in Australia called Renato Ianella who worked for a, a system integrator called uh, IPR Systems. And he, his number one collaborator was a, an Austrian um, professor at an Austrian business school named Susanna Gut. So it's Austria and Australia. <laughs> and they advanced this thing independently of any companies or standards bodies. They were kind of like the Indies. And they achieved a big success commercially in the early 2000s when ODRL, or a subset thereof, 
was used in a standard DRM for mobile uh, telephone music services in Europe. So there's something called the Open Mobile Alliance, which is a uh, mobile industry standards body. They adopted a subset of ODRL as a standard for creating uh, mobile digital music services, digital content services in Europe. In the US, however, this failed to catch on because the US, as you know, is more litigious than anywhere else on earth. And there are a bunch of patents floating around, not just Xeroxes, but others. And everyone's afraid of getting uh, nailed or sued for uh, alleged infringement of those patents. And so there was a lot of caution around it. And as a result, momentum over the OMA DRM standard died down and ODRL sort of went into a dormancy state. So I'll hold that thought, we'll pick that up later. Okay, and uh, Bill, here's just some information about ODRL, what it, how it was designed. Uh, it was basically designed on the idea of permissions that can be assigned. If you look at this diagram from uh, left to right, I've gone to the next slide. Um, Daza, I'm not sure what, uh, yep. I don't um, see that you're on the next slide. You bet. Um, um, I was just going to say, I apologize. We're having uh, some see. trouble uh, with the presentation from your what screen. What do you need to do to get to the next slide? Uh, I, so is that, uh, are we on, on the next slide? slide? Okay, got it. Okay, good. And if uh, you could just so see, uh, let me know when to advance see slide. This this slide. Model, which is taken directly from the ODRL documentation. You've got usages, display, print, play, execute. You have... Um, Derivative work rights, if you will, excerpt, annotate, aggregate, modify. Um, you've got transfer rights, which are your exhaustion rights or, or non-exhaustion rights, perhaps sell, lend, give, and lease. And then you have the distribution rights, which are things like move, duplicate, backup, uh, delete, uh, et cetera. So that's ODRL uh, 1.1, and that's where that was in the early to mid 2000s. So um, there were a couple other DRM-related or enforcement-related rights expression languages. One was from Real Networks, which back in the day was a serious innovator in the streaming media space and a serious rival to Microsoft, which Microsoft eventually um, vanquished in competition. And they had their own DRM called Helix DRM for audio and video, and then the other important one which still exists now is a EBX electronic book exchange, which was created by a startup called Glassbook that was acquired by Adobe, and it became part of Adobe's ebook uh, ecosystem, which they call Adobe Content Server. And uh, in the US, the primary two users of that technology are Barnes and Noble for their Nook system. And if you've ever borrowed an ebook, quote, quote, borrowed, unquote, an ebook from a public library, you've probably used a system called Overdrive, which also uses that technology. And it's also in very wide use in, in Europe, Asia, all, all over the world. Um, it's still very much uh, a going concern. Okay, so now we're going to switch gears and talk about the other uh, objective of rights expression languages, which is to automate licensing simply to, to uh, rely on the legal system for enforcement of the license terms, if any, uh, if any enforcement, not on technological enforcement means, but simply using rights expressions as a means of automating licensing. And therefore, um, the primary applicability for this type of rights language is in the B2B area, where you're not trying to um, issue licenses to random consumers, but to business partners. Uh, read it to distributors and aggregators and, and so forth and so on. And I would say the analog to Mark Steffick's work in Xerox Park and his paper, uh, Letting Loose the Light, is a professor at Villanova Law School named Henry Perrin, um, who published a paper called Permission Headers and Contract Law at a conference that took place at Harvard um, at the City School in 1993. Uh, this is a conference called um, Technological Strategies for Protecting Intellectual Property in the Networked Multimedia Environment. This is 1993, and they didn't say internet yet, so they had to say networked multimedia environment. This is actually a very, very seminal conference. It's probably the most 
seminal conference in this field and the uh, proceedings are still available online miraculously you don't have to go to the internet archive to get them most of the papers in these proceedings are fascinating reads if you're a nerd about this stuff like i am um, so henry perry wrote this paper about how you can use machine readable headers in contracts to automate licensing and that was the first appearance of this type of idea even though he didn't implement anything, he didn't formalize it, he just wrote about the idea and how it worked legally and so on. And uh, Parrott was actually an MIT man. He had uh, undergrad engineering and a Sloan MBA from MIT. Um, then there was a standard uh, or purported standard called the Information and Content Exchange or ICE standard um, in 1998, which was uh, led by a company that was well known at the time uh, a content management technology company called Vignette. And they had a bunch of other companies participating in this initiative. It was kind of an over-engineered, overly Baroque uh, standard. And their RSS came about at the same time as a much simpler uh, equivalent. And uh, RSS became huge, whereas ICE kind of faded into obscurity. The ICE idea was was related to this vogue, then in vogue concept of content content syndication, which was you know I'm Kanye Nass and I'm going to send out these articles that people will pay fifty cents a piece for, and I'm just going to rake in the cash because so many people will be interested in these piecemeal articles and photos. Well, that didn't work for for a number of reasons, and so ICE was about automating that type of scheme, and it kind of faded. So to talk more, so now we're going to talk more about this type of rights language, uh, which is arguably the most important uh, application of rights languages. But first, I'm going to talk about Creative Commons. So Creative Commons is something that I'm sure you've heard about, you may be very familiar with. But for those of you who are not as familiar, it is a concept that was formed by uh, Larry Lessig and a group of others, including Hal Abelson at MIT. Uh, in the early 2000s. And the idea was this notion that copyright had gone too far in terms of the rights afforded to the creator and uh, compared to what copyright started out as when at the beginning of the United States. And they wanted to kind of roll back and rebalance copyright and give more rights to the user, uh, less rights to the creator. And so the motto of Creative Commons is some rights reserved. You've heard the phrase all rights reserved. This is some rights reserved. The idea is to give the licensee more, <clears throat> more rights than the licensee would have through the copyright bundle in the copyright law. And it's, if you're talking about the applicability, copyright, Creative Commons can apply to any content at all, physical or, or digital. But the idea is that you're that it's assuming it's based on an assumption that the copyright bundle applies to piles of bits, which isn't really true, but it's a useful um, it's a useful assumption to make, and it's not like the system breaks because it's not true. The system is based on real law. Uh, and if there are people who are more qualified to talk about the nuances of this than I am, but it is important I feel to emphasize that piles of bits unattached to any physical storage medium are not um, Code under copyright law. So Creative Commons is a set of licenses. And the licenses take the forms of legal text and machine readable code that you can put in your in your files. And if you're a creator and you want to provide a, a copyright, a, a Creative Commons license, as I do for most of what I write, um, you get to choose a, a few attributes of your license. One is the attribution attribute. <laughs> which basically means you're requiring, if you set that to yes or on, then you're re requiring the licensee to attribute the work to you. Um, there's something called share alike, which means that you're requiring the licensee to offer the same rights that you're offering. Non-commercial means you're going to forbid commercial use of your content without your additional uh, permission. And then the no derivative works, uh, attribute is whether you're going to allow people to modify or, or adapt the work or whether you're going to require them to uh, redistribute it as in as is uh, state. 
So that's Creative Commons. And the way Creative Commons was originally designed was that the machine readable piece of the license would be in comments in the HTML of a web page. And um, Hal Abelson and others set out to improve that in around 2008. The idea was to make Creative Commons license terms more machine readable by using technologies such as RDF, which is an XML technology for um, essentially assigning semantics to content, to uh, structured metadata, which indicates semantics content. Number of different formal syntaxes for expressing RDF, and I leave that as an exercise to the reader, as they say. I'm not going to go over that, but there are a few different ways that the Creative Commons rights expression language can be expressed syntactically. And there's also a standard for multimedia files from Adobe called XMP, um, which is basically a standard set of header metadata that you can put in your photos, your illustrations, your movies, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And they provide a syntax for CC RHEL and that's usable in the Adobe XMP system. So just to be crystal clear about this, the idea of CC RHEL was not to turn Creative Commons into a rights enforcement DRM game. It was really meant to improve machine readability of Creative Commons, Commons licenses and eliminate redundancy adhering to what we call the dry principle, don't repeat yourself principle. So this is that much interest in CC RHEL nowadays. I feel there should be more interest in it. It's a beautiful piece of work. Um, here's some sample code which uh, basically says that this photo that's on Flickr has a, um, a Creative Commons uh, attribution non-commercial license and no derivatives license. So if you look at this page here, the second page of the sample code, it says by-nc-nd, which is the attribution non-commercial no derivatives license. And part of the machine readable piece of this is on towards the bottom of the second page where it says how you are supposed to refer to the creator in your attribution. It's this URL, laughingsquid.com, the, uh, and the um, name of the photographer is Scott Beale, slash laughing squid. Okay, so that's a sample piece of code of uh, CC RHEL. Moving on, um, another probably the most important rights language today for license automation is something called ODRL 2.x. So last, when we last saw ODRL, it was version 1.1, I think, 1. Point something. It was the mid-2000s, and it had faded into obscurity as people grew nervous about the patent scene, and DRM was sort of becoming less um, used, and certainly in the music space, it was being phased out. Now it's 2011, and Renato Ianella comes back, and he submits um, ODRL, he, he revamps ODRL, creates a version two of it, and submits it to the World Wide Web Consortium um, with a view to it being used for license automation as part of something that he called the Permissions and Obligations Working for PLE Pro uh, Permissions and Obligations uh, Expressions. So he was very, very adamant to point out this is not about DRM. This has nothing to do with any patents that talk about the use of DRM with the rights language. This is just about expressing machine readable permissions and obligations. And about a year ago, almost a year ago, the W3C advanced that to recommendation, which means it's an official W3C standard. So ODRL is now an official W3C standard, and there is a certain profile of it, meaning like a subset or an application of it, in the news industry, uh, where the main standards body is IPTC, which I believe stands for International Press Telecommunications Council, uh, called RightsML. So RightsML, uh, first of all, this is a, a sort of roughly equivalent diagram to the diagram I showed previously about ODRL 1.1. Um, this is the ODRL 2.2 information model, and it shows you that you've got assets, You've got parties uh, that are looking for rights to those assets. 
excuse me, you have rules that describe permissions and duties and prohibitions, and you can sort of look at this and get an idea of what of how ODRL works. And then again, I've included a couple of pieces of example code. This is JSON code. And this first example is uh, you can only play this movie in Germany after 2018. And you can look at this code in more detail later. Here's another one that says you can distribute this movie, but only over a mobile network as opposed to a home broadband or, or what have you. So RightsML is in use today by the Associated Press and its affiliates, among others. Uh, and there is a RightsML website which has got some very nice sample code. This is one of the samples. This has to do. This is similar to what the um, ODRL example that I showed. This picture can be displayed by a European Publishing Association licensee was in Germany. And here we show it as a RightsML data structure template, which is just a vanilla way of showing things like what permissions are being assigned, who is assigning them, to whom there's an assigner or assignee, uh, what, what permission is it, it's the action of distribution, what are the constraints on that distribution, a spatial constraint that is Germany, DEU being a code for Germany. And then on the next slide, we show the same example code in JSON. And they also offer it in XML RDF, various flavors of XML RDF. So, um, oh, I want to back up and mention, uh, let's see, where did I put this? Sorry, on the, in the footnotes of the, of the ODRL slide a few slides ago, it mentions a slide share presentation from Stuart Miles of the Associated Press, which in my view is the best presentation I've ever seen on the practical use of a rights language for license automation. It shows you the practical value of it, how the Associated Press is really using this, this thing. And it's very, very informative if you want to take a look at that. So now we're talking about, uh, we're on slide, whatever number this is, right. Here are a few other examples of license automation rights expression languages that are in use. Um, one is the Picture Licensing Universal System or PLUS uh, rights language. This is a you know, perfect example of a reverse engineered acronym. Um, in the licensed image community, the stock image uh, community. PRISM, which is a standard that has to do with content that's nominally in the consumer magazine world has a rights language. PRISM is another reverse engineered acronym that I can't even remember what it stands for, Publishing Requirements for Industry Standard Metadata. There you go. Uh, Mets Rights is a uh, library world standard from the world of government and academic libraries for communicating rights information about content among libraries. And then probably the most recent one is Onyx PL permissions language, which has to do with and Onyx is a set of metadata for books, including physical books. And in fact, started out as a physical book metadata standard for things like how big is this book? How many come in a box? How many pages does it have? And so on. And there are footnotes here with the URLs for all of these standards if you'd like to take a look at them. So. Let's step back a bit and talk about the relationships among these various things that we've been talking about. Right, expression languages, DRM, licenses, and copyright. And there's a lot that can be said about this, but here are a few points that I'd like to make that I'd like everyone to think about. Maybe we can discuss some of these things when we meet next week. Licenses are, of course, contracts. They are legally enforced rights and restrictions. DRM is a technologically enforced rights and restrictions mechanism. The purpose of a REL is to enable precision in describing rights in both licenses and DRM systems. And RELs can encode licenses that confer more rights than you get in the copyright bundle. That's the basic idea of Creative Commons. What additional rights would you like to offer to the public besides what the copyright law um, tells you? They can also be used to describe licenses that confer less or more restrictive rights than copyright. And if you were to look at most end user license agreements for things like Amazon, Apple, whatnot, 
um, that will be the case. If you were to encode those EULA terms in a RHEL, they would be more restrictive than, or, or typically there are exceptions, uh, but in, in general, these, these EULAs are more restrictive than what you would get with copyright if they have to do with content. Um, and then once again, if we're talking about pure digital content that is not attached to a storage medium like a DVD, CD, uh, thumb drive, et cetera, then copyright doesn't really apply. It's all about licensing. And this was just affirmed very recently in an appeals court decision written by none other than Judge Pierre Laval of the Second Circuit, Mr. Transformative Use, um, that involved a startup called Midigi located across the river in the Prudential Center in Boston that was trying to build a marketplace for used digital music files. Fascinating subject, which I'd be delighted to discuss offline. Uh, very interesting case, very interesting startup and so on. Uh, and then the final uh, thing that I'd like to mention in terms of what do these things have to do with each other, RELs, DRMs, licenses, and copyright, um, you can have a RHEL and you can use it with a DRM, but it won't make DRM capable of emulating copyright rights. It just, people talk about how RELs, sorry, about how DRMs are restrictive compared to copyright. I prefer to say that they're just not capable of emulating copyright with any degree of precision. And I'd like to amplify that point by talking about something that really didn't get enough notoriety in my opinion, uh, something called the Digital Media Project. It was a standards initiative that was started in 2003 by a man named Leonardo Carilione, who uh, is the founder of MPEG. So this is someone who has a great deal of experience in the standard tech standards area. He was trying to create an open interoperable DRM standard that respected and emulated real world content usages, including copyright law and, and all of its ramifications in multiple geographies around the world. This is an extremely, extremely ambitious project. And perhaps the most interesting thing to come out of that project, which technically is still alive, it's kind of on low simmer, um, was something that they tried to do called traditional rights and usages or TRUs or TRUs. And this is actually a link uh, which I'm not going to show you now, but Dazza will have the URL and can share it. They did an exhaustive, or, or maybe not exhaustive, but prodigious amount of work in trying to describe precisely various different traditional rights and usages around content in different geographies around the world, including fair use, fair dealing, and things of that nature, to try to catalog these and be able to represent them in machine readable ways. This would have been a very, very interesting project if explored to its limits, whatever they may have turned out to be, but it was never really completed. Anyway, um, that just sort of shows you what the limitations are with regard to RELs and the real world. I'm going to finish this talk by tying this to the Music Modernization Act, which Covering in this in this course and talk about how rights expression languages could relate to the areas around the Music Modernization Act. So I'm going to probably I'm going to go over some material which is probably redundant to what other people are talking about, people like Vicky Nowen and George Howard and so on. But at the risk of repeating these people, I'll give you the, at least my version of the background of the Music Modernization Act. So there is a section of the Copyright Act called Section 115, which establishes a compulsory license for something called composition mechanicals. I think I have skipped a slide. Sorry, yes, we're gonna go back and talk about um, music rights and services. Yes, this will, sorry, I skipped that one. So in order to understand the Music Modernization Act, we need to understand a little bit about the basics of copyright and music. And once again, other presenters may go over this, so at the risk of being repetitive, I'm gonna go over this. Every music recording has two copyrights. There's a copyright on the composition, which you can think of as the sheet music with lyrics. And then there's the copyright on the recorded performance recorded by a performing artist or recording artist. And when you offer 
but you have a digital music service that offers digital music, you need to have licenses for both things, for the compositions and the sound recordings. So today's digital music services, or what we call DSPs, digital service providers, what they offer is basically three things. They offer interactive streaming. We're talking about Spotify, Apple Music, Tidal, Deezer, Rhapsody, et cetera, et cetera. Interactive streams means you, the user, can choose whatever you want to listen to and then it's streamed to you. There's something called conditional downloads, also known as tethered downloads, which are you can download the music to your device and play it off your device until your subscription is canceled. So that's why it's conditional. And then there are permanent downloads where a user has to pay, let's say, 99 cents a track to keep the download permanently. And typically that's DRM free. It's an MP3 or an MP4 AAC file. So these services have to pay a few different royalties. And again, this is a typical case. There are exceptions. There are nooks and crannies to this. But they have to pay reproduction and distribution royalties to record labels for sound recordings. They have to pay something called a mechanical, which is a reproduction and distribution royalty, uh, just conventionally called a mechanical, for the composition, not the recording, but the composition, to the music publisher. Um, and that is a compulsory license under Section 115 of the Copyright Act, which says that anyone can make a reproduction of the composition, which normally, or, or in older times, would mean do a cover version of that composition. That's guaranteed to you by law, but you do have to pay a royalty for that. You need to fulfill certain other conditions, mainly paperwork type conditions. And then there is something called public performance royalties that you pay to, an, in, in, again, in the typical case, to a, an entity called a, a, um, a PRO, a PRO, such as ASCAP or BMI, and there's a couple other smaller ones in the United States. And this is very much a national uh, scale thing. And in some cases, you'll pay directly to a music publisher instead of to the PRO in the case of a bigger publisher, such as one of the major publishers. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the Music Modernization Act, which was just enacted recently. And the, pro the problem with Section 115, the compulsory license, is that it is not also a blanket license. You have to license each composition a track at a time. And what happens is, if you're a music service like Apple Music or Spotify, you get feeds of tens of thousands of tracks per day from record companies, from companies that aggregate indie artists and so on. And for each of those, you have to go find the composition that's being played, which is not obvious in some cases. And then you have to secure a license for that composition by fulfilling what amount to paperwork requirements under Section 115. And that is an enormous pain in the neck because not only is it a lot of just paperwork, but there's also ambiguity about um, what the composition is because you may not necessarily get the information about what that composition is when you get a feed from a record company. There's data floating around the industry that's old, that's incorrect, that's missing. It's actually maybe even be disputed. And this is basically a huge burden on these uh, digital music service providers, and it's led to lawsuits where this hasn't been, or allegedly hasn't been done correctly. Spotify has been sued, Apple has been sued. So the legislative solution that was enacted last year was one that rep that does essentially two things. One is that it finally implements a blanket license instead of requiring track by track licensing. Is something that was attempted several years ago, but it didn't pass through Congress. And then the other thing that it does, which is a little bit more controversial, is it creates a single agency to process these uh, mechanical royalties for every DSP instead of each DSP doing it, doing the job itself, or more typically hiring a third party agency such as uh, the Harry Fox agency to do that for them. Um, there's also a clause in, in the act that's somewhat controversial that. Uh, composition rights holders can't sue DSPs anymore for alleged uh, a lack of li improper licensing, but we're not going to talk about that. That's got little to do with rights expression languages. So, um, 
the license structure isn't really affected by the Music Modernization Act, but it's worth talking about anyway, because the Music Modernization Act sort of brings out the benefit and encourages development of automation mechanisms for automating these licensing uh, requirements. So let's look at what the license is. It's um, some rights that the publisher is granting to a digital service provider. It's a blanket statutory mechanical license. The performance license is still necessary, but it's not affected. Um, this is independent of the performance right. And so the question becomes, how do you represent that in a license, in a, in a, sorry, in a rights expression language? And one thing that exists already that can be drawn on is something called DDEX, which is a standard, it stands for Digital Data Exchange, a music industry standard for communicating information about sound recordings that is used in cases like a record label has just released an album and they want to tell music services about it, so they send a message in this format to the music services. And part of this message syntax is a set of codes for the rights that the record label is granting to the digital music service, which include on-demand stream, conditional download, and permanent download, and then a bunch of others. But those are the three relevant ones that you can take from the DDEX standard as the rights that you are dealing with in a potential rights expression language uh, implementation of these rights for the Music Modernization Act or for mechanical licensing. So here, here's an interesting idea. You can think of this as possibly being governed by two systems. One is a license automation system that governs the activity between the publisher, the music publisher, which is the blue box on the left, and the DSP, which is the orange box in the center. And then that in turn will, will um, indicate what happens between the DSP and users on the right in green. So the publisher, let's say, says, I'm granting you the DSP. We'll give some examples. You know, I'm Warner Chapel Music. I'm granting Apple Music um, these rights, on-demand stream, permanent download, and conditional download. Then the DSP uses those rights in another automation system, which is a DRM system. And by the way, all these DSPs now use DRM for streaming and conditional downloads to govern what happens with the user's music on, on the user's devices. And there'll be a right for on-demand streaming. That's pretty straightforward. The problem is that for this to be automatable with a rights expression language, the idea of conditional download needs to be made more specific than it is now. Now it just says, okay, conditional download. We need to know what does that mean? Okay, that means download how many times, download until when, play until when, play how many times. You need to make that more specific in order for it to be automatable. So that's just sort of an interesting limitation on how these rights map to the real world implementations that you would wanna make with the rights expression language. So I'm gonna conclude by offering an exercise which kind of ties this all together. And the exercise is to represent the Music Modernization Act relevant rights in a rights expression language type syntax. And the first one of these is the simplest, which is just to represent them as a rights ML style data structure, just to show who the entities are, who the licensor licensees are, what kind of rights are being granted, what are the parameters of those rights and so on. For extra credit, you can implement it in um, ODRL using the syntax of your choice, JSON or one of the RDF syntaxes. And then for really extra credit, and this would be an industry needle moving kind of thing, represent all rights for interactive music DSPs as an ODRL profile. In other words, do what RightsML has done for the news industry for music. DDEX doesn't get us there. It's not really a rights expression language, even though it has some rights metadata encodings included. Um, a very viable basis for communicating rights among business entities in the music industry would be to take an ODRL, uh, to take an, or create an ODRL profile uh, for music rights. So that's your extra, extra credit exercise. Um, create it 
that covers streaming, conditional downloads, permanent downloads, and then all the composition and sound recording rights that you require uh, for these digital music services. So with that, I'm done. Uh, and I would like to say thank you very much for your attention. And thank you very, very much to Daza for inviting me to do this, because this is clearly a topic that's near and dear to my heart, and I like talking about it, and I hope that you enjoy learning about it. Well, thank you, Bill. Uh, that was extraordinary. Uh, uh, we okay. Some um, <laughs> little technical snafus in the beginning uh, with your... Um, presentation uh so i, I yes, think, uh, if you are talking i cannot hear you and advance oh. the slides uh the exactly. slides are uh, of course available uh, on your session page uh, can i just ask bill uh, as the students come up with um their takes on on the exercise uh w w would you be uh willing to kind of give a little bit of feedback as we as we get toward the class so we can start with a with a bang absolutely okay so then uh, we'll take responsibility to to package those up and share them with you. Uh, and I really look forward to hosting you in person at MIT on the first day of our computational law course uh, this year, which is uh, Tuesday, January fifteenth. And um, and uh, you know everybody out there in internet land, give a big round of applause for for Bill uh, doing the first proper academic presentation I'm familiar with anyway on rights expression languages in this context. Uh, it was much needed, overdue, and I'm very grateful for it. Thank you. Okay, thank you.